Welcome to the last part of the lecture. We're going to start off with model specification and identification. These are the building blocks of models. Imagine we're trying to understand something complex like human personality or self-esteem. To do this, we use tools called models. These models help us break down the complex idea into smaller, understandable parts. Let's explore the key ingredients that make up these models. We have observed variables. These are the things we can measure or see, like the number of items on a scale or survey. We have the number of factors. These are the hidden underlying ideas or feelings we're trying to understand. They're like the secret ingredients in a recipe. There's model parameters. These are the rules of the game. Some rules we decide on ahead of time. These would be fixed. And some of these rules we figure out as we go. These would be the free or estimated. We also have a theoretical foundation to think about. This is our big idea or hypothesis that guides the whole process. It's like our blueprint. We also have model identification. And this is how we make sure our model works and doesn't have any contradictions. Think of it like solving a puzzle. Every piece has to fit. I'm going to take you through two two examples. The first one, understanding self-esteem, which would be a simple model. Imagine we want to understand self-esteem and we build our model with observed variables with 10 questions on a survey that people answer about themselves. We're trying to understand only one hidden idea, self-esteem. So that would be one factor. Regarding model parameters, well, some rules are fixed, like the number of questions, and some are free, like how important each question is. We also have model identification. We make sure that our model can be solved and does not contradict itself. In conclusion, we would now have a simple model to understand self-esteem using 10 questions to explore one underlying feeling. In this second example regarding understanding personality, this would be a more complex model. Let's refer back to the big five personality traits. Here's how we would build this model. For our observed variables, we'd have a lot of questions on a survey to understand different parts of personality. For the number of factors, we're trying to understand five hidden ideas like how extroverted or conscientious someone is. For the model parameters this time, our rules are more complicated. We have to be very careful about which rules we fix and which we figure out as we go. Regarding model identification, we make sure our complex model can still be solved without contradictions. The conclusion for this example would be that we now have a more complex model to understand the big five personality traits using many questions to explore five underlying ideas. Ideas. So whether we're trying to understand something simple like self-esteem or something complex like personality, we use models to break things down into similar understandable parts. We set rules, use surveys, and make sure everything fits together to help us get a clear picture of the hidden ideas we're trying to understand. It's like building with blocks or solving a puzzle. And the final picture helps us understand ourselves and others better. So we'll do a couple of examples. First, a basic one-factor model that could be highly relevant in clinical work, especially in understanding role conflict. Let's say this was made up of three items. We could have work family conflict with a statement like, I often find it difficult to fulfill my family responsibilities due to the demands of my work. The level of measurement would be a Likert scale from one being strongly disagree to five strongly agree. The next item could be surrounding personal professional goal alignment with a statement, I feel torn between pursuing my personal passions and my professional obligations. Again, this is on that Likert scale from one to five. The last item could be social role expectation conflict with the statement, I often feel pressured to act differently in various social roles, for instance, as a parent, a friend, or an employee, and it causes me stress. Again, this would be on a Likert scale from one to five. These manifest variables would be directly observed and measured in a study, and the responses to these items would be used to understand the underlying latent variable of role conflict. The choice of these variables would ideally be grounded in psychological theory and previous research on the concept of role conflict. Going through that list, we had three items, and that makes it easy because we know there's three observed variables. This was a three-item measure that we knew should relate to only one underlying factor. It was a measure of role conflict. Aside, role conflict is a psychological term describing the stress that people feel when they have conflicting roles in their lives, such as a parent who's also a full-time worker or a 
person who must balance personal and professional responsibilities. It's a concept of significant interest in clinical psychology, as it can lead to anxiety, depression, and other mental health issues. When it comes to parameters, let's see what we have. For our factor loadings, they're represented by lambdas here, lambda sub one through lambda sub three. These are the weights showing how each observed variable is influenced by the underlying factor of rule conflict. For the factor variance, that's represented by psi. In some notation, it can be represented by the Greek letter phi, but remember, these change across various disciplines, and the most important part is that we understand where it lies on the diagram to represent the factor variance. So here, it's still going to be represented by the psi. This indicates how the role conflict factor itself varies within the population. For our residual variances, these are represented by theta. These are the variances within items that are unexplained by the factor, essentially the leftovers. Each residual will vary. In addition to residual variances, we have residual covariances, allowing these residuals to vary together, though typically we won't use this in a basic one factor model. Regarding clinical relevance, understanding the interplay of these parameters can be essential in a clinical setting. For example, for treatment planning, by understanding the underlying factor of role conflict, clinicians can tailor therapy to help clients cope with the specific challenges tied to conflicting roles. It can also help with assessment of efficacy because monitoring changes in the factor loadings over time may allow for the assessment of therapeutic interventions' effectiveness. You can also identify subdimensions because though residual covariances are generally not used in a simple model, they could, in some contexts, help identify subdimensions or deeper underlying things within the data. This might provide insight into the specific areas of conflict or stress that are not adequately captured by the broader role conflict factor. So this basic example of a one-factor model serves to underline how a seemingly abstract statistical method can have real and direct implications in the field of clinical work. CFA, when it's particularly applied to understanding complex constructs like role conflict, allows clinicians and researchers to measure abstract psychological constructs with precision and insight. In a clinical setting, this would then translate into better diagnoses, more personalized treatment plans, and a deeper understanding of the mental and emotional lives of those seeking help. It's a reminder that behind every equation and parameter, there is a human experience waiting to be understood and addressed. Therefore, we're going to continue to explore these concepts, always with an eye on the real-world clinically relevant applications. Let's examine now a hypothetical multi-factor example related to emotional well-being, specifically focused on assessing positive emotional experiences and emotional resilience slash regulation. Let's take a look at our manifest variables and our factors. For the observed variables, we have four specific questions capturing different aspects of emotional well-being. The first item, I often feel content with my life. And we're saying that's going to load on positive emotional experiences. I am able to find joy in daily activities. This item is also going to load on positive emotional experiences. For the last two items, I struggle to manage my emotions in stressful situations. And separately, I can bounce back after a personal setback. These two items load on emotional resilience slash regulation. For the first two items regarding positive emotional experiences, remember, it's going to be the first two items. And for emotional resilience and regulation, those are items three and four. Now we have to look at our parameters. We have four factor loadings representing how strongly each item relates to the corresponding factors denoted lambda sub one, through lambda sub four. We have two factor variances that capture individual differences in positive emotional experiences and emotional resilience. We also have factor covariances. Considering correlations between the factors, such as the link between positive emotions and resilience, we have residuals, their variances and covariances, and this is covering leftover variants unexplained by the factors. And it's typically not a primary focus in this context. There is a lot of clinical relevance in our field. This model helps clinicians differentiate between areas of positive emotional experiences and areas that require strengthening resilience. This differentiation can guide more precise diagnoses and target interventions. For treatment planning, for example, if a client has high scores on items three and four, but low scores on items one and two, a therapist might focus on enhancing positive emotional experiences while maintaining resilience skills. And in regards to the theoretical understanding and the research, 
this model supports developing theory around the interconnectedness of different emotional aspects. It could lead to new research on how enhancing positive emotional experiences might simultaneously boost emotional resilience. We also have to think of the ethical considerations, though. We have to ensure that the chosen items are empirically supported and culturally sensitive. We also need to recognize the limitations of a simplified model in capturing the complexity of human emotions. So to conclude, the specific application of a multi-factor analysis to emotional well-being provides a nuanced tool for assessment, intervention, and theoretical development in clinical sites. By carefully selecting items related to positive emotional experiences and emotional resilience, we create a powerful framework to understand and assist clients in a more tailored way. While the presented example is illustrative, real-world applications will be much more complex, and it requires a thoughtful blend of statistical expertise and, more importantly, psychological insight. Model identification refers to the possibility of estimating a unique solution for each parameter in the model based on the available data. Put simply, the goal here is to have enough known values, data from your sample or your observations, to estimate your unknown values, which are the parameters in your model. It's just like solving an algebraic equation. Another way put is that model identification and psychological assessment is about defining the perfect balance of knowns and unknowns in our data. It helps us ascertain if the model is solvable with the data at hand. This is analogous to solving an algebraic equation, and it can be crucial in various aspects of psychology, such as mental health diagnosis, personality assessment, and therapeutic interventions. Here's how it breaks down. We have a just identified model where the number of estimated parameters equals the number of data points. It's a one-to-one -one match between knowns and unknowns. The clinical relevance here is that in psychological assessments, this situation could lead to a very specific but very inflexible model, leaving no room for validation or error estimation. It's like fitting a puzzle perfectly but having no spare pieces to verify the fit. We also have an under-identified model, and here, more parameters need estimation than available data points. This means that multiple solutions might fit, and this creates ambiguity. In therapeutic models, this might reflect an incomplete understanding of a patient's symptoms or personality traits, leading to ambiguous or conflicting interpretations. Again, just like a puzzle with missing pieces, it's challenging to see the whole picture. Lastly, we have the over-identified model. This means that more data points are available than the parameters to estimate. This allows for validation, cross-checking, and comparison with other models. This is the best case scenario. In therapy, an over-identified model might mean that practitioners have various perspectives and additional information to validate a treatment plan or someone's psychological profile. This excess of information can help tailor interventions to the patient's unique needs. Let's think of an application in confirmatory factor analysis. Well, if CFA aims for an over-identified model to test theoretical constructs like mental health disorders or cognitive abilities, one latent variable like depression with three indicators like sadness, fatigue, and loss of interest helps us create an over-identified model if it's carefully constructed. And such models help in personalizing a diagnosis and a treatment plan. The extra data can lead to more accurate, robust results, which affects therapeutic approaches and patient outcomes. Once again, there are some ethical and practical considerations. We have scale identification, meaning standardizing variables like fixing latent variable variants or selecting a reference item, which we'll get to later, is essential for meaningful interpretation. We also need to think about model flexibility. Balancing specificity and flexibility is key to adapting to individual patient needs. And lastly, we have to think about evidence-based practice or EBP. Choosing the best fit model based on empirical evidence supports ethical and effective therapeutic interventions. And I want to break down model identification a little bit more. To come back to the just identified model, this is the model where the number of estimated parameters equals the number of data points. In other words, there is one and only one solution that can be estimated. Remember I talked about that algebra example? Well, if you have one equation, that would be your one known, and one
one variable to solve for one unknown, then you have a just identified situation. Coming back to the under identified model, in this case, you have more parameters to estimate than available data points. This is problematic as you can end up with many possible solutions and it becomes impossible to say which one is correct or the best fit. It's like having an algebraic equation, but two variables. There are infinite number of solutions here. And circling back to the over identified model. In this model, you have more data points than parameters to estimate. This situation is desirable in factor analysis as it allows for model testing. It enables you to assess how well your model, i.e. your pre-specified pattern of factor loadings, error variances, and more. So it's going to enable you to assess how well your model reproduces the observed data. If an over-identified model fits well, it increases confidence that the model represents the structure of the data. And this is analogous to having more equations than unknowns in algebra, because if a solution satisfies all equations, it's a good indication that the solution is correct. So in the context of CFA, you're always aiming for that over-identified model, because it's going to allow you to test whether your theoretical model of how the factors can relate to your indicators is a good fit to your observed data. An over-identified model will provide you with fit indices to determine if your model needs to be refined. And then it's going to allow for comparison with other models to find the best fit for your data. Remember that structural equation models have underlying parameters. So for the parameters in a three-item CFA, these are all the possible parameters we can consider due to model specification. Here, factor variance is going to be in purple. Factor loadings are going to be green. Residual variances are labeled in orange. So with the one-factor variance, the three-factor loadings, the three residual variances, and the three residual covariances gives us 10 parameters in total. In CFA, we typically don't expect to see correlated residuals, which are those residual covariances we see in blue at the bottom, because this assumption is already accounted for by the common variance in the model. It may happen, but that is way beyond the scope of this class, so let's not worry about it. Let's just keep it simple. So if we have 10 parameters in total in this diagram, let's think about taking these covariances out. So when we remove them, we now have seven parameters in total. Now remember, parameters can be either fixed or free. Fixed are pre-specified and not estimated from the data. Free parameters will vary and will be estimated from the data. There are subtraction formulas to get the number of free and fixed parameters. We do this to find out what kind of model we have, like if it's just identified, over-identified, or under-identified. Let's take a look on how this works in the next slide. So here, the equation for the number of free parameters means you need to take the unique parameters minus the fixed parameters. If we let the analysis estimate the factor variance the way it is uh, with the factor loadings and the residual variances, then the number of free parameters is going to be seven. And that's because there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven that are unique. We are also going to need to calculate the known values. And there's an equation for this where the known values is equal to K times the sum of k and 1, and then this entire thing will be divided by 2. Here, k is going to be the number of items. So in this three-item CFA, for the known values, we have three items. So when we plug in, all we did was substitute k. 3 plus 1, that's 4, times 3 is going to give us 12. And 12 divided by 2 is 6. Therefore, we know now that there are six known values. Keep the known values in your memory bank, along with the previous value, which are the free parameters in your memory bank as well, which was seven. So seven free parameters and six known values. We need this to calculate the degrees of freedom. And the degrees of freedom are the number of known values minus the number of free parameters. This is going to tell us what kind of model we have. Here, the degrees of freedom is equal to six minus seven, because we had six known values and seven free parameters. This gives us a value of negative one. This is sad times, everyone. This model is considered under-identified. If we go back to our chart, under-identified, that's because the number of known values is less than the number of free parameters. In other words, your degrees of freedom will always be negative if this situation comes up. Remember, sad times. Therefore, we're going to need to change or 
fix the number of free parameters because we can't change the number of known values because these are already known. So we have to fix the number of free parameters at this point. And how do we do that? We use what's called the marker variable method, specifically for the latent variable variance. Here, lambda sub ij means that i is the item and j is the factor. So when you replace those with numbers, just understand that the first number refers to the item and j is the factor number. Using this marker item method in our study, we'll be selecting a marker item, which allows us to set the scale for a latent or hidden variable like therapist quality. We're fixing the first loading of each factor to one. And that's because we're transmitting the scale of this marker item based on the loading. For the free parameters here, we're going to calculate our free parameters as seven minus one equals six. Well, why did we get that for our number of free parameters this time? Last time we had seven and that came from one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. But because we used the marker item method and we fixed it, this value here is no longer free because we fixed it. Therefore, it gets removed from our account. That's why we subtracted one. Therefore, if we go back to finding out what kind of model we have for degrees of freedom, our known values are still six, but we reduce the number of free parameters to six as well, leaving us with zero. Now this becomes a just identified or what's called a saturated model. Now this is neither good nor bad, but we can run the model now. It's like having a puzzle with exactly the right number of pieces to fill those gaps. No more, no less. Again, we can run the model, but we don't have any extra information to test how well it fits the data. And this is why we generally prefer to have at least four items in our model, because more items provide more information and that makes the model more robust. So let's see what happens when I turn this model into one that has four items. In this scenario, I'm adding a new item that's called availability, like for a therapist. We'll do the marker item method again. So we're going to fix the first loading of each factor to one. We now get to calculate our known values differently. We calculate our known values as four times four plus one. And that is because we now have one, two, three, four items. We plug into that formula again, four plus one, that gives us four times five, which is 20. 20 divided by two is 10. Therefore, the number of known values is 10. The free parameters remains the same. Seven minus one, because we fixed one of them, is equal to six. Now, our degrees of freedom changes a little bit. This time, we have 10 minus six is equal to four. What does that mean? It means our model becomes an over-identified model. And this is a good thing. This is good times. It means that we have more information that we need to estimate our parameters. This is is that extra pieces in a puzzle example. It gives us more ways to see if the picture fits together properly. There's another method though. Let's say you did not want to fix the first loading of each factor to one. Well, you could do what's called the Z-score method, or in some circles, it's known as the variance standardization method. This method is a powerful approach to standardizing latent variables like therapist quality. And I want to break down this process and understand why and how we use it. So what is it? In the Z-score method, we standardize the latent variable to have a mean of zero and a variance of one. Think of this as recalibrating a scale, making everything relative to a common standard. For the latent variable variance, we fix this variance to one. In practice, this means the standard deviation of the latent variable, such as therapist quality, is set to one. By fixing that variance to one, we're effectively saying that therapist quality is measured in units of standard deviations. This common language allows us to compare different therapists therapist on the same scale. This makes our calculations as follows. We have six parameters because we fixed one of them. This time we fixed the variance at one. When we calculate our degrees of freedom, it's going to be six minus six equals zero, which comes back to that just identified model. Remember, this isn't necessarily good or bad. We can still run the model, but we have no extra degrees of freedom to assess how well the model fits our data. This situation again underscores why we generally want at least four items in our 
entire model. Let's go to that situation again, where I add availability. Using the same z-score method, we continue to fix the factor variance to one, keeping our latent factor standardized. For the known values calculation, our calculation now becomes four times four plus one divided by two, which equals 10, just like we did in the previous example. The number of free parameters, of course, remains the same at six. And for the degrees of freedom, we now have 10 minus six equal to four. And the exciting news is that our model is now over identified again. Remember, this is the good times. It's having the extra clues in a mystery. It provides more ways to see if our conclusions are on the right track. So to summarize, the z-score method offers us a standardized way to compare hidden traits like therapist quality. By carefully considering our items and constraints, we can create models that are more versatile and insightful. And I want to go through a number of examples, specifically using the z-score method for simplicity, as I want you all to gain a good understanding of how to calculate the number of parameters and observations, along with the degrees of freedom to determine what type of model we have. In this first example, we have eta sub one. This is eta. This is our lambda. This is our epsilon sub one. Remember, ij is item factor. So this is theta sub one one, which means that it is the residual variance for the first item and the first factor. It's the residual variance for the first item of the first factor. We set our factor variance to one. We're using the z-score method. Now let's look at the number of parameters that we have. We have our factor loading and we have our residual variance. The number of observations is one. Now that's not because there's only one item, because when we add more items, this is going to change a little bit. This is just because there's no local dependencies with one item. If you remember what local dependencies are, those are covariances. You can't covary with one item. Therefore, we have one observation. So we're going to plug into our formula for dia, which is our known versus minus our free. This is simply the number of observations minus the number of parameters. And here it's one minus two, giving us a negative degrees of freedom. And thus it's not identified. So let's look at another example where this gets extended. For the number of parameters, we have two factor loadings and two residual variances. So the number of parameters is four. Recall from the previous slide how I said it's going to change when you add another observation. It's not just looking at one item, two item. Here it's three. And the reason behind that is that we need to think of our local dependencies, meaning we have an observed variance for each item and a covariance. We'll use that formula as these models get more complex to make it easier on us. When we recalculate degrees of freedom here, we get three known minus four free parameters. But again, that's a negative degrees of freedom and it's still not identified, meaning you can't estimate a model that only has two items loading onto one factor. Let's jump into another example. I add another item. So we know that the number of observations is going to change again. We have three observed variables, but you need to know those number of local dependencies. In other words, we got to count the covariances. So there's a covariance here, a covariance here. And don't forget this third one here. So there's three local dependencies or three covariances. You can see how this would get really complicated as you add more items, which is exactly why we use that formula from before, which is K times K plus one, all divided by two. So here we replace K with the number of items, which is three times three plus one divided by two, giving us six known parameters. We also need to look at the number of fixed, or we also need to count the number of free parameters. Here we have three factor loadings and three residual variances, leaving us with six free parameters. When we plug into our degrees of freedom formula, we're going to take the number of known observations and the number of free parameters, which is going to be six minus six. And we finally have a just identified model, that saturated model. This means it has exact fit, which means it has one unique solution to this model. As a reminder, this is neither good nor bad. So moving to the next example, we can actually get a good model fit because of the complexity. So here, let's look at the number of observations. This is where you need to look at the number of items and covariances. So remember there's six items, but regarding the local dependencies, it's going to be a lot. One, two, three, four, five, six, 
seven, eight, nine, ten, and you see how it gets a little messy. We're going to stop with that, and we're just going to go back to our formula, where we have six items times six plus one divided by two is going to give us 42 divided by two, which is 21. So we have 21 observations, or 21 knowns. Then we need to calculate the number of parameters. We have six loadings. We have six residual variances. And don't forget, we have one factor covariance. We don't have factor variances because we use the z-score method and fix them to one. Therefore, we have 13 parameters. And if we calculate degrees of freedom, it's going to be 21 observations minus 13 fixed parameters, giving us what we want for good times, which is the over-identified model. But I want to show you how these models can get even more complex. Well, what if we had a cross-loading? Cross-loading is when an item is going to load on more than one factor. So regarding the number of observations, that's not going to change because that's regarding our items. So we're still going to get 21 observations, but the number of fixed parameters is going to change because now we added an extra factor loading here plus our original six that we had from the previous slide, giving us seven factor loadings, six residual variances again, and one factor covariance. Recall, we do not have factor variances because we fix those using the z-score method. Calculate the degrees of freedom. We'll use the same process, but this time it'll be 21 minus 14, giving us a positive degrees of freedom, which is good times because that's over-identified. Let's look at one last complex model. Now, I just want to show you what you could do in some context, instead of having a cross-loading, I'm adding a residual covariance here. And that's essentially taking the covariance of two residual variances. This is just the link between two residual error terms. That being said, again, the number of observations doesn't change because our items didn't change. We have six loadings, six residual variances, and now one residual covariance. And again, one factor covariance because these are set to one. That gives us 14 parameters again, which means we get seven degrees of freedom for a good over-identified model. I want to explore a core concept in statistical modeling, which is the maximum likelihood estimation method within CFA. So in context, in our field, we often aim to understand underlying mental constructs like depression, anxiety, or even resilience. These latent variables cannot be measured directly as we found that out in EFA. So we need to build models. And that's where CFA comes in. And the maximum likelihood method is our trusted guide to finding the best fitting models. It's an iterative process. Think of maximum likelihood as a seasoned detective. It sifts through data, examines it from different angles, and changes its approach slightly with each iteration, never resting until it finds the most likely explanation. In clinical terms, this is akin to unraveling the intricate web of symptoms to understand and an underlying disorder. You have to think about handling roadblocks though. Now, detectives sometimes hit dead ends. The model might get stuck, but unlike a detective, we can guide this process by specifying different parameters, like adding clues to lead it back on track. And that's what leads me to what's called convergence. When the likelihood changes so minimally, that's convergence. It's like solving a mystery, arriving at a diagnosis after careful observation and analysis. It's a critical moment in both statistical modeling and clinical assessment. In essence, maximum likelihood is a bridge between data and understanding, theory, and practice. It helps us see the unseen, articulate the unspoken, and translate complexity into clarity. I want to get a closer look as well. Let's zoom in on our detective's magnifying glass. Maximum likelihood has its quirks. One of these is its dependency on multivariate normality, which is a statistical assumption that's often more theoretical than real in a messy world of human psychology. Challenges with normality? Well, in an ideal world, our data would follow a perfect bell curve, neatly fitting into the parameters of a normal distribution. But humans are complex, and our data rarely adheres to such neat patterns. And this is where we enter with the robust maximum likelihood. Luckily, our statistical toolbox is well equipped. We have robust maximum likelihood, otherwise known as MLR, which is an advanced technique robust to these violations of normality. Think of MLR as 
best maximum likelihood savvy partner adept at navigating the twists and turns of real world data. What's beautiful about MLR is its flexibility. If the data are normal, MLR equals the maximum likelihood. If not, it gracefully adjusts. Essentially, robust maximum likelihood takes the best of maximum likelihood estimation and adds a layer of real world robustness. To put it simply, in our field, where perfection is a concept and not a reality, robust maximum likelihood stands out as the method of choice. It's grounded, adaptable, and attuned to the nuances of human behavior and experience. This leads me to the last part of the lecture, which is surrounding model fit. There's several types of model fit statistics. So I want to first understand the chi-square test. It's a statistical procedure that plays a critical role in assessing how well our hypothesized model replicates the observed data. It asks the fundamental question, does our model reflect reality? Or in more clinical terms, does our understanding theoretically accurately mirror the complex interactions and behaviors we observed in our patients? Let's break down these numbers in this example, in this chi-square test of model fit example specifically. The value of 74.462. This number represents the chi-square statistic. It's calculated by comparing the difference between the observed and expected covariance matrices. In simple terms, it tells us how much the data deviates from what our model predicts. For the degrees of freedom equaling eight, this value is critical in interpreting the chi-square test statistic. It essentially tells us how many independent pieces of information are available to estimate our parameters. Think of it as the room for our model to move and adapt to the data. Having a p-value less than 0 0.001 is not good. This is an alarming signal in the chi-square test because a p-value of essentially zero indicates that our model's assumptions do not exactly fit the observed data. So we would have to reject our null hypothesis, which assumes that a perfect fit exists between the model and the data. This result prompts us to reflect and possibly revise our model. Lastly, if we look at the scaling correction factor of 1.0083 for the robust maximum likelihood, remember what I said before, the scaling correction factor accounts for potential violations of normality in our data. It's that fine tuning adjustment that ensures our chi-square test is robust, even when the data may not meet all statistical assumptions. So what does this mean in practice? This particular test is telling us that our model isn't an exact fit for the data. It's like fitting a puzzle where some pieces don't align perfectly. We might need to re-examine our model structure, rethink some assumptions, or consider different statistical techniques. I also want you to know that this chi-square test is super sensitive to sample size, meaning when you have higher sample sizes, it's more more likely going to be significantly different, which is why we have other model fit statistics. Now let's look at the comparison of nested models through the chi-square difference test. Nested models allow us to test different hypotheses within the same general framework. Imagine that we're trying to understand the underlying causes of a particular mental health disorder. We can create different models that include different sets or numbers of correlated errors to see which one fits the data best. So for the chi square difference test, this test is our key to comparing these nested models. It asks a very specific question. Is there a significant difference between these models in how well they fit the data? It's like having different lenses to view the same landscape and asking which lens provides the clearest picture. Let's dive into the specific results in this example. Looking at the row of no correlated errors with 19 parameters, a chi square value of 74.462, eight degrees of freedom, P less than 0.001. This model here assumes no correlations between the errors. The high chi-square value and low p-value tells us that this model does not fit the data well. If we look at one correlated error with 20 parameters, our chi-square value decreases, our degrees of freedom decreases, because adding a correlated error improves the fit. And this is shown through this reduced chi-square value. However, this p-value is still significant, and it signals that the model still does not perfectly fit the data. This is where we look at two correlated errors. Adding another correlated error continues to improve the fit. Notice that the p-value is now above 
0.01, indicating a less significant misfit with the data. And this is our best fitting model among the three. When we're comparing models at the bottom, when we're looking at the zero correlated errors model against the one correlated error model, this comparison demonstrates a significant improvement when moving from the model with no correlated errors to the one with one correlated error. And in the last row that says one correlated error against two correlated errors, this similar comparison shows that adding a second correlated error significantly improves the model fit. Let's explore other fit indices, focusing on what's called the comparative fit index, which is the CFI, and the Tucker-Lewis index, the TLI, which are two robust incremental fit indices. These tools help us understand how well our models describe the relationships between variables, often leading to more effective interventions and improved patient outcomes. We have to understand fit indices, though. In the world of statistics, it's not enough to build a model. We got to validate it. We got to ask, how well does it fit the data? Fit indices provide us like a yardstick. It allows us to measure, compare, and ultimately choose the model that best captures the underlying reality. Now, incremental fit is about improvement. It's about progress. It compares your model to a baseline model where no relationships exist. It's akin to comparing the effectiveness of a specific therapy to a general supportive environment. It helps us see the unique impact, the added value of our chosen approach. For the comparative fit index, the CFI is a popular incremental fit index. It ranges from zero to one with higher values indicating better fit. Ideally, we look for values over 0.95, although over 0.90 is often considered acceptable. Think of CFI as a percentage score on how well your model captures the relationships within the data. It's like a grade on an exam, shows us how close we are to a perfect understanding. The Tucker-Lewis index, the TLI, is similar to the CFI, but with a slight different mathematical formulation. It's another way to grade our model, offering a complementary perspective. Together, CFI and TLI provide a robust evaluation, ensuring that we're not missing any vital insights. And it's essential to recognize that these indices are not without challenges. They can't be strong if the null model, which is the model of no relationships, is decent. If the baseline is already good, showing improvement becomes more complex. When I talk about the baseline and the null model, this is like the worst case scenario type model. This caveat reminds us of the intricacy of human behavior and the need for a nuanced evaluation. Because if the null model has an RMSEA, which I'll talk about on the next slide, of less than 0.158, this challenge becomes particularly significant. Incremental fit indices like CFI and TLI compare the specified model with the null model. And if the null model has a good fit, then showing that the specified model Expanding upon the previously discussed concepts, let's delve deeper into the details of two essential fit indices, the root mean square error of approximation, otherwise known as the RMSEA, and the standardized root mean square error residual. These measures are vital tools in evaluating the fit of our statistical models. For the root mean square error of approximation, the RMSEA, this is a measure used to assess how well a model with optimally chosen parameter estimates would fit the population's covariance structure. It's a critical aspect of absolute fit, which directly examines how well our model replicates the observed data. The RMSEA is closely related to the chi-square test of model fit. While the chi-square test evaluates the difference between observed and expected covariances, the RMSEA adjusts this for the complexity of the model, measuring the misfit per degree of freedom. It's a way of penalizing models that are overly complex, keeping our analyses parsimonious and interpretable. There are some ideal values. Lower RMSEA values indicate a better fit, with values under 0.06 often considered excellent. However, in practice, you're really aiming for under 0.05. Think of it as the margin of error in approximating the population's true structure. The smaller, the better. The RMSEA informs us whether our chosen model is a plausible representation of the underlying reality. It's a caution against overfitting and a guide towards simplicity and precision. It plays a vital role in both research and applied settings, helping us develop interventions and theories that 
that genuinely mirror the complexities of human behavior. And then this leads me to the standardized root mean square residual, the SRMR, which is another absolute fit index. It represents the standardized difference between the observed correlation matrix and the predicted correlation matrix. In simple terms, it quantifies the unaccounted variance or covariance within the model. One thing you can try to think of when you're looking at this as the difference between the observed correlation matrix and the predicted correlation matrix, thinks of regression and the sum of squares. What does it measure? Unlike RMSEA, which works on a per degree of freedom basis, SRMR considers the entire residual matrix. It provides an overall assessment of how far our model's predictions are from the actual observations. Again, think of regression. Lower values of SRMR are better with values under 0 0.08, usually deemed acceptable. This threshold represents a fine balance between capturing the underlying relationships and avoiding the trap of overcompensation complicating our model. In practice, SRMR helps us identify areas where our model might be missing significant relationships or where it might be imposing connections that do not truly exist in the data. And lastly, let's explore the Akaike Information Criterion, the AIC, and the Bayesian Information Criterion, the BIC, which are two critical comparative fit indices used in statistical modeling. These tools are instrumental in model selection, especially when we have multiple models to consider and need to identify the one that best fits the data. Starting with the AIC, it's a measure that strikes a balance between the goodness of it of the model and the complexity of the model. It rewards models that fit the data well, but it also penalizes models that include too many parameters, and this helps us avoid overfitting. AIC can be used to compare different models, even nested ones, as long as they are fitted to the same data. This flexibility makes it highly valuable in various fields, from economics to ecology, where researchers often grapple with multiple competing hypotheses. Lower values of the AIC indicate a better fit. In practice, a difference of more than 10 between the AIC values of two models is often considered decisive evidence in favor of the model with the lower AIC. Or the Bayesian information criterion, the BIC is similar to the AIC, but includes a stronger penalty for models with more parameters because it integrates Bayesian probability into the model selection process, making it not only a measure of fit, but also a statement about the probability of the model given the data. While both AIC and BIC can be used to compare competing models, BIC's stronger penalty for complexity often leads to the selection of simpler models compared to AIC. This makes BIC more conservative, favoring models that make fewer assumptions. Like the AIC, the BIC is also used in various scientific disciplines to compare models that are not nested. Its ability to incorporate Bayesian principles gives it a unique edge in certain contexts where probabilistic interpretation is critical. So how do we choose between the AIC and BIC? We want to consider your objectives. If you're more concerned with prediction, AIC is going to be the way to go. But if you're interested in understanding underlying processes and prefer a more parsimonious model, BIC is going to be more appropriate. And in practice, you really want to go with the BIC in the CFA because the whole process is to find these underlying causes and look for the most parsimonious model. Consider the nature of your data, the underlying assumptions of the models, and the scientific questions at hand. Sometimes using both AIC and BIC in tandem can offer a more comprehensive view. The impact on decision making, well, these criteria do not merely guide academic inquiries. They shape policies, inform clinical decisions, and influence how we understand complex systems. Now, you want to embrace complexity with caution. While complexity might lead to a better fit, it can also lead to overfitting. AIC and BIC act as safeguards, reminding us that simplicity often holds profound truths. This concludes our lecture on confirmatory factor analysis.